Good morning and welcome to worship. Please uh, rise and join me in the uh, call to worship. Who will tell the good news to the world? Here I am, send me. Who will share God's love with those on the margins? Here we are, we will go. Who will care for the poor and the sick? Here we are, we will do it. Who will visit the imprisoned? Who will speak out for the oppressed? Here we are, and though we tremble, we will follow Christ. Let us join in this time of worship, ready to be in the body of Christ. Amen. Our opening hymn is 238, Thine is the Glory. Please join me in the prayer of confession. God, you are one, but we are fragmented. We confess that we do not work together as your body. We insist on our own way. We put our wants above others' needs, and often our perceived needs are not necessities. We justify ourselves at the cost of others' well-being. Forgive us for our selfish ways, for not seeing others as our brothers and sisters. Forgive us for not seeing ourselves as part of a larger body in you. Restore us, bind us together, so we might know that we need each other in all our diversity to be your body. 
Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hear these words of the assurance of pardon. All things are made new by Christ. All things are restored in Christ. The fullness of life in Christ is found in forgiving others, finding healing and reconciliation, and working for justice, knowing that death does not have the final word. The opportunity for new life is now, not at death. Eternity is now. Embrace the fullness of life in Christ, knowing you are forgiven, restored, and loved. Amen. Please join in uh, hymn 366, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling.
first scripture reading is found in Acts 3, verses 12 to 19. Acts 3, 12 to 19. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us, as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the Holy and Righteous One and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect help in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that this Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. And our second uh, reading is found in 1 John 3, verses 1 to 7. 1 John 3, 1 to 7. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. This is the word of the Lord. Dear Lord, as we uh, hear your words today, help us to uh, take them and open our hearts and minds to hear your words. Bless our time together. In your name, amen. Some of you may have had a similar experience to me. When my wife and I got married, we knew we wanted to have kids. When we were expecting our first child, I went through a roller coaster of emotions, from excitement to fear to terror, and then back to excitement. I'll be honest, I wasn't sure what kind of a dad I was going to be, but I knew that I had signed up for the responsibility and privilege of raising a child. And so I had to decide to be the best that I could. And yet, in the back of, the, of my mind, there was a growing sense of doubt as we approached that due date. That doubt centered on what would happen if this baby, my baby, didn't grab hold of my heart like babies have been doing to parents for ages. What if I didn't love this baby like a baby needs to be loved? And then, on a great day in November, many years ago, I found out that my capacity to love another human being grew exponentially. My heart filled with love for this messy, helpless, loud, cute, and utterly adorable baby boy. I was awkward as I held him for the first time, and I probably almost drowned him in his first bath, and I gave him some pretty significant 
significant scratches on an early hike through the woods at Calvin Crest. The list could go on from all the things that I've done wrong with this son of mine. But the important thing was that I discovered that I could love a baby enough for it to survive and maybe even thrive. And then a few years later, we found out we were expecting another. I knew from experience that I could love one child, but man, what about two? Was there enough to go around? Would I love one of them more than the other? And then a daughter arrived and my heart grew a few sizes bigger as I loved that baby girl. I don't think I'm alone with some of these thoughts and feelings. And when I read a passage like the one in 1 John, I understand it just a little bit better now that I'm a dad. God doesn't just have one child or two, but many children. And with each one, God's heart grew a little bigger, if that's even possible. So what does it mean to be a child of God? Is it any different than just being a child of human parents? I think there are a few things that we can see in this passage to help us understand what exactly it means to be a child of God. The first is that we are loved by God. Just take a moment to think about the fact that you are loved by the creator of the world. The same God who called the universe into being and who designed the molecular structure that is the building blocks of everything we see loves you. And not the same kind of love that you love a cheeseburger with. No, this is an extravagant, costly love that is lavished on us by this awesome and personal God. My wife will tell you that I am not a romantic. I'm practical and frugal to the point of maybe even being stingy. Flowers seem like a waste of money because they die. Cards aren't that much better because, well, I would rather look at a living tree than a piece of paper. And gifts, well, it's hard to find that perfect gift, isn't it? But I know how much those gestures mean to my wife. So every once in a while, I square my shoulders, I march into high V, and I purchase the smallest bouquet of flowers. And sometimes I even take one of those free cards and write a short note to go with the flowers. Husband of the year material for sure. Now don't get me wrong, I love my wife but I'll admit that I probably don't lavish my love on her. God, on the other hand, loves us so much that John 3.16 says God sent his only son to die for us. He was willing to sacrifice his own flesh and blood son to adopt us, a bunch of low-life sinners who are ungrateful, hypocritical, and helpless. So to be a child of God means that we are loved lavishly and excessively. During summer camp staff training, one of the challenges that I have is teaching college-age youth how to parent a group of kids for a week. Most of my summer staff come into the summer with a preconceived notion of what their cabin will be like. And usually in their minds, it's all fun and games, and everything smells like roses. I can tell you it does not smell like roses. After the first week, it's interesting to hear their comments about what reality is like. Kids are tough. They need love and lots of it. But that love looks different than the buddy-buddy kind of love that most new counselors envision. 
The love that I ask my counselors to give is unconditional, but also based on keeping the kids safe, encouraging growth, developing their spiritual lives, and engaging them socially. It's exhausting, repetitive work that requires creativity, consistency, and the ability to not care if a camper doesn't think that you're cool right now. Lavish and extravagant love is not permissive. The second way that we are children of God is that we are a reflection of God. Just like I see bits of myself in my kids, God sees parts of his character and nature within us. I think there are two ways that we are a reflection of God. The first is that God has imparted a bit of his, of his DNA to us. We are made in God's image. And so we will look like God a little bit and act like God a little bit. And this is a good thing. If we didn't have some of God's DNA, some of God's essence, we would be no different than the animals. Perhaps that bit of God that is contained in us is our soul or our conscience, the part of us that tells us when we are doing something wrong. But the more important aspect of being a reflection of God is that we can begin to act more like God or develop some of those character traits. There are things that I see my kids do that annoy me greatly. I'm being honest here, right? And at least some of the time, those are the things that they're picking up from me. But there are other characteristics that are a reflection of the good traits that they see in me. And it's enjoyable to watch them grow and develop from imitating their parents to developing their own personality and their good characteristics. The same is true for God. God has these character traits that are innate to himself. God doesn't have to work to develop them since they are part of the essence of who God is. We, on the other hand, need to work and grow and develop these, those traits as a reflection of God. And these aren't mysterious traits, since they are laid out in Galatians 5 as the fruit of the Spirit. And they include love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These traits are brought out through the work of the Holy Spirit and are a reflection of God's very nature. So the barometer that we can use to measure how much of a reflection we are of God is found in that list. Are we full of joy, peace, and patience? Do we show love, goodness, and kindness to others? Are we faithful? gentle? And do we demonstrate self-control? And I know that I struggle with each of these at different times, and I would guess that you do as well. But here is the good news. We don't have to produce these traits on our own. We have the Holy Spirit to help us, and the Holy Spirit is willing to do that if we only The third re result of being a child of God is that not only do we seek to be a reflection of God, but we seek to obey God with an aim for purity. The Old Testament is full of rules and regulations for what obeying God looks like. For a good, a good sampling of these rules, just peruse the book of Leviticus. Devout Jews abide by a strict code following the Old Testament rules and also follow instructions and interpretations of those rules. It's a complex system, and it's easy to go astray. The church is often no better. The, de the denomination I grew up in had plenty of spoken and unspoken rules about what it looked like to be a Christian. No drinking, no dancing, no swearing. The list went on. As a child and a teen, 
I felt that my closeness to God depended solely on how well I was doing in keeping the rules. I had a mental checklist going and often felt that I wasn't being good enough. I would try harder, but invariably I would fail and ultimately feel like a failure. On the other end of the spectrum, though, is when we don't take the Bible seriously enough and think that God, that Paul's words, everything is permissible for me, found in 1 Corinthians, applies to being able to sin freely with no consequences. And there are plenty of people in churches today that live like their sins don't matter. Like God doesn't care what we do or how we act. The reality is that God does care. The passage in 1 John is pretty clear about the role of sin in our lives. Verse 6 says, No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. The reality is that we are habitual sinners. And thus, we don't really know God. I don't think this passage is talking about making a mistake. But if you are habitually lying or gossiping or stealing, you should probably rethink where you are at in your relationship with God. And really, sin is a disruption of that relationship that we have with God. I know when one of my kids disobeys, it takes a while for both of us to get back to where our relationship should be. Sometimes it just takes an outstretched arm from from me to let them know that I'm not upset with them. But sometimes it takes some time and space. Sin or disobedience to God is the same way. It drives a wedge into the relationship. We can be unsure whether God still loves us after committing the sin. We can be concerned that the sin was too big. But God's grace and forgiveness is enough to cover all of our sins. And because we are children of God, we should want to obey God and aim for purity. We are called to be holy, and not the type of holiness that allows us to put up our noses in the air because we are better than everyone else, but the type of holiness that is authentic and real with our, with our struggles and our successes. I've talked a lot about how my being a father has changed how I viewed my relationship with God, my Heavenly Father. I hope that my kids can see that even though I tried to be a good dad, that their Heavenly Father is so much better than their earthly father. But some of you might have trouble seeing God the Father as a good thing. Maybe your earthly father was not that great. Maybe he worked too much or just wasn't there at all. Maybe he generally did not exhibit any of the fruit of the Spirit. And I'll admit that if that was your experience growing up, it will likely be difficult to view God the Father as good, loving, and kind. But there's hope. God is constant. God is always there and available. If you have been living your life trying to get close to God through following the rules, maybe it's time to explore the alternative. Not the permissiveness of much of our culture, but the extravagant love of being a child of God that gives us a part of the very essence of God and causes us to be a reflection of the character of God and the desire to strive to be more like God every day. It's not an easy journey, but it is rewarding. It is a fulfilling life that allows us to live out our lives by being who God made us to be. We can live confidently knowing that we are secure in our relationship with God. That father-child relationship that allows us to be anchored and allows us to stretch and grow. Please pray with me. 
Dear God, as your children, help us to experience your lavish and extravagant love and to uh, live our lives in a way that's uh, pleasing to you. In your name, amen. Uh, please stand and uh, sing our hymn of response, 215.
always good to uh, catch up with the church family. And uh, as you find your seat, short so you guys can uh, can uh, catch up uh, but as you as you find your seat uh, what's new in the life of the church what are uh, what are joys and concerns that you have April 27, I believe, is uh, that Saturday um, work day here at the church. speaks to me. Any others? All right. Please, uh, please join me in prayer. Voice in the silence, you called out light from nothing, called out life from cold earth and water, and called out your children to live into your ways. We have forgotten our created image, that we are your children. We have forgotten the miracle of our creation, that we live now. We have forgotten your voice, that the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. Help us to remember, to recall all you have done for us in creation, and that you are doing a new thing. Help us to remember all Christ did for us in his earthly life, and all Christ is doing for us now, and all Christ will do for us. Your time is not our time. Call us to tune our hearts to you, to listen for your voice, and to follow your ways. In the name of Christ Jesus, your only Son, we pray as you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, our Lord. time if the ushers will come forward we will uh, collect the tithes and offerings. <laughs>
Lord, as we give you back uh, a portion of what the blessings that you have given us, we ask that you take these gifts for your glory and for your kingdom. Take these gifts and use them to uh, minister to the world. In your name, amen. Our hymn of response is uh, page 630, Ferris. go from this place, know that you are loved by God. You are a child of God. Go and serve God with all of the love that he has lavished upon you. Go in peace.